So let me just pray as we begin. <laughs> Father, we do praise your name. Um, that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is a historical reality. The resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical reality. We thank you that God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We thank you that you stooped down so low to raise us up so high. And you saw how much we were in need and you have met our need in Jesus Christ. You've brought us from death to life, and not just life now, but life for eternity. What an amazing gospel it is that has saved us. And Father, um, we want to love you. We want to respond in worship. And we want our prime motivation for evangelism, our prime motivation um, for life to be your glory. We want to lift your name up. You, Jesus Christ deserves to be glorified um, in Riverside, Christchurch Riverside, and in the area around it, and the city around it. Um, Jesus Christ should be lifted high. And people need to know the gospel. Um, Father, in this time of desperation, people have got to hear the gospel. So um, please, Father, let that be the context tonight as we come to thinking about evangelism. And some of us, I guess, thinking seriously about participating in door to door, but hopefully all of us serious about evangelism and serious about wanting to reach the people around us with the, the message of the gospel. And so please, by your spirit, work tonight, make this fruitful and profitable. Um, please challenge us and change us again tonight. Help us to love you better and, and as a result, help us to want to love the people around us better as well. Amen. Amen. So I'm really grateful um, that you're here. And the big point um, that I want to push tonight is this, that I think in the context that we are in, in our estates, uh, I normally say three, I think there's really about five estates if you break them all up properly. But in our estates, I think that door-to-door -door evangelism is urgently needed. Um, to reach the harvest field we have been given with the gospel. You see, our church services and our evangelistic events are good, but they're not enough because just so many don't engage. And so the big point tonight, it's needed. And in the light of Revelation 20 and 21, which Scott preached on yesterday, I think we must go out. Um, not every one of us necessarily, but I think as a, as a church family, we need to go out to those that we say we love and we need to go out to them with the gospel. So that's the big point. I, I think door-to-door door -door, door -door evangelism is urgently needed so that we can reach the people that we won't reach um, any other way. So that's what I think. And that's what I'm going to try to unpack now. And then we're going to look at practicalities and, and how we have done it in the past and how we're going to um, keep doing it in the future as well. So we've just had our gospel story series, four sermons um, going through the Bible, and in, the, in that short series, we've had an explanation for the way the world is now, but also we've been given the wonderful solution, haven't we? We've thought about the, the great solution of the cross and God's promises, and that solution to sin and death. Now, I hope and I pray that that alone should fill us, fill loving people, because Riverside's a loving place, it should fill loving people with urgency to allow the people around us to have that same explanation for why this world's so broken, but also the same hope um, why this world can be fixed, how this world has been fixed by God, what the future is. But, you know, especially when we consider how the series ended. Um, so I've listened to Scott's sermon from yesterday, and I hope all of you have had a chance to listen to it as well if you weren't there yesterday. But when you consider how that series finished yesterday in Revelation, I think we've got to be fired up to do what we can to, to give the gospel to others. So I want to read yesterday's passage again in Revelation 20, verse 11, and I'll go a wee bit further this time because it just really hammers home the point to 21, verse 8. So I'm just going to read that, make a brief comment on that, and then really get into the practicalities of door-to-door -door evangelism. Um, so here's Revelation 20, verse 11, up to 21, verse 8. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. <clears throat> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Just what an incredible contrast. Um, and Scott just did a brilliant job, I think, anyway. I hope you do too. Just a brilliant job yesterday of really underlining the seriousness of it and, and the greatness of it um, for God's people. How wonderful that future is going to be, but just how terrible um, it is for those who haven't come to Christ. The people around us who look like really good people and think of themselves as good people, but without Christ. Um, that, that, that those verses just read, uh, they make you tremble. There is such urgency in what we do as a local church. Now imagine sitting in your front room and watching small children playing on a busy road. Would you do it? <laughs> All you do is sit. You're watching them playing on a busy road and you're just sitting there. Well, that wouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen, should it? It's, it's actually the opposite of love, isn't it? To watch people in trouble and just to leave them in trouble, especially to watch people who don't even know they're in trouble um, and leave them in trouble. You see, as a church family, and um, we don't want to be sitting at the front window watching people playing on a busy road. And um, People need the chance to turn to Jesus in repentance and faith. Like They need the chance to have their name written in that book that Scott talked about yesterday, it written in the book of life. Now, often that's but as the prime motivation for evangelism, but actually it's not, it's, it's, nearly, it's nearly the prime motivation, but here's the prime motivation for evangelism. Far more importantly, even than the rescue of people, God deserves his name to be glorified and lifted high everywhere, but in our area. And we are the local church. We should really want the name of Jesus to be lifted high. Jesus is the victor, isn't he? He's the winner at what a cost, but he is the champion. What incredible salvation Jesus has won for us. And, and I hope, like me, you have delighted in the amazing grace that we have talked about in these last four sermons. Um, grace from beginning to end. We must want to speak of a God like this to others, even if it does cost us. But here's the problem in our area. Here's where I think door to door is so important. Um, it's the problem that is faced by the pub landlord and it's the problem that's faced by the church pastor. I spoke to the landlord of the pub, I think I've shared this a couple of times now, um, and the pub landlord feels that people's doors are firmly shut in our area. Their lives are firmly mapped out. <laughs> um, they don't really want their lives to be disrupted. You see, we are both a self-contented culture, happy with what we've achieved for ourselves, and so we don't want anything disturbing us. But also we're a fearful culture. Um, we don't want whatever security we've managed to forge for ourselves to be disrupted. Um, in the song at the start, it talked about fear. We live in a time of fear, and we do. And, and so people, they're content with their life to some extent. So please don't disrupt me. And they've managed to get some sense of security, and they don't want that disrupted at all. And you see, the gospel... And going to church, that's actually a very disruptive thing. There's no way, even, even if you did have a pastor who was like, you know, really well known and, and, and people just thought he was the bee's knees, even if you had that type of guy, the most charismatic guy in the world, look, there's no way the people in our estates are going to come flocking in to us. So we need to find good ways of going out to them. Um. So I, I want to watch a short video now. 
um, that somebody else has done. This is just one of the questions that comes up, obviously, when you're talking to unbelievers about the gospel and believers, to be fair. It's the question of suffering. And I like this video. It's about four minutes long, but it shows a variety of angles that a question on suffering can be answered from. But more than that, I don't just like it because of that. I like it because it reminds me that there's people in houses around us in Riverside who are wrestling with questions like this. And perhaps if we were to go to the door, we might be able to point them to Jesus in their trials. So um, just enjoy this video and we can talk maybe a little bit more about it later on. Thank you. When it comes to the issue of suffering and the fact that there is suffering in this world, we have to take that very seriously. I've seen so many Christians who blow off the question and say, we can jump right to the answer. This is a question that doesn't just come from the, from the mind, it comes from the heart and it comes from human experience. We have to take the problem of suffering seriously. It's interesting if you look back in the history of ideas, the problem of evil wasn't really considered such till about the 17th, 18th, 18th century onwards. And of course, it's been trawled out more and more by our new atheist uh, friends these days, being the idea that if there's a God who is all good and is all holy and is all powerful, how could evil exist? Since if he was all good, he wouldn't allow it. If he was all knowing, he would know what's going to happen. He would stop it and so forth. But I think when we look at it, this argument from evil is actually a, an argument that points us towards also the existence of God. Evil is a departure from the way things ought to be. And if it is a departure from the way things ought to be, that means there is a way things ought to be. There is a design plan for this universe. And the only way you can have a design plan that is good, that is supposed to be perfect, is if God exists. So the, the problem of evil really drives us right back to the existence of God. It does not drive us away from Him when we think about it um, uh, from, in, from a biblical perspective or even from, from a logical perspective. If God truly has created this world in freedom, then there is always the possibility, if it's truly free, for freedom to be both used in good ways and in evil ways. So we can explain the human problem with evil because there are times when humans perpetrate evil against their own bodies, against one another. They use their freedom, misuse their freedom really, in ways that bring about evil. What are those people who are suffering? What do they say about this? Generally speaking, around the world, those who are suffering say that God must exist, that He is their hope, He is their reason, and this isn't just a crutch to hold on to. He has seen God, they have seen God come through for the people around them. So the question, first off, that's asked, how could God exist if there's so much suffering in this world? That's not one that people who are suffering usually ask. Of course, in the industrialized West they do, but generally speaking around the world, it's not one that people normally ask. I myself lost my husband and didn't in a million years see that coming. Um, I would say that um, everybody who's gone through grief experiences the absence of God from great wonderful Christian people like C.S. Lewis to myself to others. I've read in all lots of grief literature that there is that sense that God has abandoned you. So I would say I understand where you're coming from. But I would also say in my own process that as I continue to wrestle with God over it, to argue with God, to pour out my feelings before God, even feelings of, I don't like you anymore, God, I don't love you, how could you do this to me? There is a way in which God is very present in that dark experience, and that's the only way I can describe it. As I clung on, um, and as I reminded myself that all who wander are not lost, um, I, re I was comforted by that and recognized that even in those dark places, God comes near. But even in those places, we can trust that God is with us. That's what the psalmist affirms. And I think ultimately our experience affirms that as we come to see grace being given to us, even in those places that we thought we had gone beyond God's grace because of what we were suffering. But the Christian answer to the problem of evil is that the God who made the world also brought the solution. He wasn't staying detached, as Dorothy Sayers says, didn't stay up in heaven and think, oh, look at them all suffering, or there's pain and sorrow here, and I'm just leaving them to it. The Creator Himself stepped into the equation 
bore the penalty, the price of the sorrow of healing the universe, of forgiving the brokenness, of restoring the creation. And so I feel the Christian answer is a good answer. It doesn't exhaust the answer philosophically, but it's better than the alternatives, and I would take it as a, a credible response. Great. Some good accents there. Very interesting. The the first guy, um, I think Nubel Qureshi, I think his name is. I've read a couple of his books, but um, he actually died of stomach cancer. And, and right up until the end, um, he was urging people to carry on um, sharing the gospel with people from different faiths. You know, it didn't, the whole question of suffering, personal suffering for that guy just sharpened his desire for people to have these type of conversations with people. And um, there's a whole load of helpful videos and training and, and things out there to help people answer questions now the reason i one of the reasons i like that video as i said there was a, a variety of approaches to it and i like the lady who basically just shared you know i lost my husband i've struggled i've wrestled and actually that's one of the the key things for our strategy when we go to do door to door we're not going with a script we're not going as robots we're going as normal riverside christians who, when they're asked a question, if we do get into good conversations, we're asked a question, we're just going to give as honest an answer as we can give and trust that um, God will use that for his glory. You see, I think, I really do believe door to door, um, it is a wonderful God-exalting sinner-saving ministry, but I believe it could be that for you to be involved in. Now, you might be thinking never in a million years, and that's okay. Um, God can work with that as well. But um, I guess I want to share our aims. So there's different people have different aims for doing things. Here's our aims for doing door to door um, in Riverside. So um, the big aim, of course, is to glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ, by reaching lost people with the gospel. But I guess the way I used to do door to door, I did it on teams. I would go on these Baptist youth teams when I was younger and we would knock doors and we would hope to get the gospel shared with people. But our, in, in Christchurch Riverside, our door-to-door -door ministry is not a standalone ministry. It's supposed to feed in to our whole church life. And it's supposed to do that in the following ways. So just keep that slide up as great, Tim, as I go through these. So um, what I'm hoping for, what has happened already, um, as we have done door-to-door -door a number of times, and we stopped for COVID, but we were just getting into our swing, I think. Um, but one of those aims is just to have warm contact. We want people to have warm contact with our church. We want people to know we're here. Some people don't have a clue where we're there. I know we've been singing outside and we'll have done lots of different evangelism over the years, but some people just don't have a clue that we even really exist. So one of our aims is a very simple one. We want people to have a nice, warm contact with our church family. So what you're going to, as I explain uh, how we actually do it, people are allowed to text us and say, don't call. They're allowed to tell us, don't call at their house. We give them a chance to, to, to do that. And even in those texts that are sent to my phone, because it's my number on the on the letter, um, I've had some really warm responses with people. So I've just when they've texted back, I've said, "Oh, thanks for letting me know. Um, we'll take you. We'll, I'll, I'll delete this number. We'll make sure nobody calls on Sunday. Um, but if you want anything from us, if you if we can help you in any way in the future, just let us know. Thanks. And for some people, that's it. They just say thanks. Other people have said, "Oh, well, thanks very much um, for doing that." So. Even in a refusal text, when people are saying, don't call, um, we're having these warm contacts with the Christchurch Riverside family that people wouldn't otherwise have had. So that's one of our aims. Obviously, one of our aims is we want to have significant gospel conversations with people on the doors. So we are praying that we will get good conversations and we have had many good conversations with people on the doors already. So I'm highly confident that even following COVID, the, 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 the fruit will be even greater. Um, but also, we want to understand the people around us. We genuinely do want to hear from them. We want to know what they think of church. We want to know what they think of us. And we want to know how they think. Um, and that will help us to better bring the gospel to them, do better events, do better things in the future. So one of these those aims is just to understand the people better. So even if you have a terrible day um, doing door-to-door, -door, a terrible hour, hour and a half doing door-to-door, -door, um, and really you feel like you haven't had any progress at all, you might understand the people a bit better by the end of it. You might think by the end of it that people, um, they really don't like being disturbed. How are we going to, what, what are we going to do different? What can we do different to reach these people? 
Um, so we'll understand people a little bit better. But also, we just want a chance to invite the church. Now, if that's all it was, we could just post loads of flyers through doors. And there's a place for posting flyers. Of course there is. But, but we hope that it, with these conversations, a nice warm contact, they see that we're people who do care about them. We see that we're polite people who ask permission to, to come to their door as well. Then we do hope that that chance to invite them to a church service or some of our ministries um, the kids stuff, the prime time stuff, whatever, or some events that are coming up in the future. We hope we'll get these chances to invite. And so those aims, the big one at the top, to glorify God and those next four, they're all really, I guess they're outward looking aims because the, hopefully they'll, they'll allow us to bring the gospel to people, understand people better and invite people. So a lot of those are about external things, but one really significant aim one big reason for us to do door to door, one big reason for you to consider it and pray about it, even if it scares you, is because doing something like door to door, it is a brilliant way of increasing our love for and our dependence upon Jesus. So there's an internal benefit, a massive internal benefit to door to door. It is a way of growing us in prayer and boldness because it's it's a ministry that costs, you know, um, I even though I like doing it and I think I'm good at it I think God has um, um, gifted me so that I'm, I'm okay at it but even then I, I do dread it I promise you like I'll just be honest with you on the Sunday that it's on it's, it weighs on me all day and until you get going with it you're thinking I can't wait till this is over and then when you're doing it you think this is really good <laughs> I'm really really enjoying it but there's a cost but door to door allows God's people to pay a cost but God always blesses people who, who sacrifice. He does. That's just the way he's so generous. He, he doesn't need to, but he's so generous. When you pay a cost, God blesses. So there's, those are our aims. And I think they're very important because if you get those aims in your head, then you can go out um, and do an hour, an hour and a half door to door. And you can get back and you think, have we pushed any of those aims further forward? If your only aim is making Christians, Pretty much every week you're going to be crushed because people take ages to become Christians in our country um, most of the time. But if your aims are these things, and if you understand that even if you've been changed by that hour and a half so that your life revolves more around Jesus and you care more about him and less about your reputation, if, you, if you've got these aims in your head, every week you can go home and praise God and you can um, glorify him because he's done something really significant. So that's why those aims, they're very important. And I hope even already that you can see, hold on a minute, even if I'm a quiet person and a nervous person, even if a person that maybe finds it hard to just chat to people on the hoof, maybe maybe this is a ministry that would benefit me and would, would honour God. So I want to get to the practicalities of it now. I promise you soon I'm finished speaking, but I do want to get to the practicalities of it. So as I said, it was another church in Barnsley um, who have been doing this for a long time. Um, and they say that it is a ministry of warm calling rather than cold calling. So what that means is that the week before, um, I have always done it, but maybe others would do it at some point as well. But I've always gone, uh, I've picked like the 40, the 60, the 80 houses that we're going to call at on that Sunday. We do it on Sunday afternoons. The week before we... Um, Share a, we post a letter through the door that says to people we're planning to come, who we are, what we're trying to do, when we're going to be calling, and then how they can get in touch if they don't want us to call. And maybe I'm being very hopeful here, or if they're really keen for us to call, so we'll go to them first. We'll make sure we get to them. Um, so if you stick the slide up, you might not be able to read it, but I'm going to read the letter out that we um, post. So we say to people, dear neighbour, we're Christians from a local church called Christ Church Riverside who meet each week in Parkstone Primary School. Um, we want to get to know better the people who live all around us. That's why we've decided to visit each home in our community. We're planning to knock on your door for a quick chat sometime between 3 and 4.30 this coming Sunday afternoon. I've left the date in there, but uh, we would change the dates each time. We are aware that people get fed up with religious groups and door-to-door -door salesmen who seem to only want to get their pre-packaged message across. We would like to be different. We're keen to hear about you and the things that concern you. But it may be that you really don't want us to visit you. In that case, please just email or text me and the details are below. Tell us your address. We'll leave you alone and we'll not keep any of your details either. If you don't want to visit, but you have questions you would like us to try to answer, then feel free to put those in an email or a text. We are planning to visit a lot of houses on your street. So if you would quite like a visit, 
let us know so that we can make sure we come and see you and don't run out of time. We look forward to seeing you very soon with very best wishes, Pete Burney, the pastor of Christ Church, Riverside Hull. And then there's different contact numbers. I think Tim, I might have to update the, the email address there. I'm not sure. But um, now it's really, really important, that letter. I love that letter. And it's it's a bit like what the Church of Barnsley posted, but it's been changed a bit to, to match who we are a little bit more as well. But what that letter means is that people are warned and they can say no, but it also means that people know who we are. And I think what it means is permission, actually. <laughs> now, you don't need permission in this country to knock people's doors. You're allowed to do it. But I think it, it means that we are trying to get a bit of permission. Now, what does happen in, in reality is that you knock the door sometimes um, and you say, hello, how are you doing? I'm from Christchurch Riverside. And we posted a letter this week through your door just telling you that we're coming and I'm wanting to chat with you. Um, did you get the letter OK? And sometimes you get a blank looking guy whose wife's read the letter and thrown it in the bin or whatever. But even in that case, because you've tried, you generally get off on a good foot. Um, you've tried to be polite. You've tried to give people a chance to say no. And so people generally, um, you start off on a good foot with them. And, and I don't think I will ask Dave later if he remembers or Neil, if he remembers but, or Martin, but I don't think um, that we've really had anybody that's been cross with us so far. I don't think, but maybe you can correct me later or Isabel might remember. She's got a good memory, but I don't think so far that we've got off on the bad foot with anybody who we've knocked the door off. I'm not saying everybody's really been really keen to talk for ages, but I don't think we've had anybody just being really aggressive um, early on. So we send that letter out and then on the day People come to um, my house first and we get to mine about half two. We have a time of prayer um, and then we just drive to the area where letters have been delivered and, and we get into pairs. We generally try to be a, a, a bloke and a, and a lady, a male and female, but not always. It doesn't always work out that way. And then we go to our first door and we knock and it's best to ring as well or ring and knock because if you if you ring and you don't know if the bell's um working or not then you feel a bit awkward for a while standing there thinking should I knock or does it sound rude so I always ring the bell and knock the door um, as well small practical detail and then we just simply say something like this we start with like we're from Christchurch Riverside we're a local church we meet every Sunday in partial primary school I hope you got our letter saying that we get a knock on your door about this time um, and generally people say yes or no and, and if they say no we say oh well sorry you didn't get it um, but we really want people in our area to have a chance to know who we are and we want to get to know um, the people in our area and then we think in terms of the, this framework the three f's and i just think it's very very helpful so we start off with f for facts so a simple factual question like have you lived here long do you enjoy living here um do you think it's a nice place to live it's an easy reply isn't it Somebody says, oh, I've been here 10 years, been here all my life, just moved in um, last week. And if you get that just moved in one, that's gold, isn't it? Because you can tell people about the area. You can offer to help them out if they need any help. You know, there's a whole load of things that can come from that factual question. And, and that factual question um, sometimes then leads into a whole load of other things as well. And maybe you can ask them about what the work is or how they relax. And, and actually that, that question alone, warm contact. And if at the end of that question, the person's obvious that they don't want you to stay any longer, um, I think what I, I would still want to be saying to people, try and push it just a little bit further anyway. Try and go to the next step. I talked to Liam about this. They're doing um, door to door down in, in Newland. And, and he was saying, let try to always push people just to that next step. So if you get a facts question and they really want you to go, try to move on to friends and family. Um, but if they're really, really wanting you to stop and it's obvious, that's fine. Don't, don't worry. If you've got that far, you've got a warm contact. So we, F1 is facts. Then we move on to F2, friends and family. You know, do you have friends or family nearby? Now, that's a very helpful question because it opens things out a little bit more. You find out if people have got a support network around them. Um, you can find out that people um, have people that look after them or maybe they don't or maybe they're lonely. And, and the reality of that question there is sometimes if you, if, you're asking it, you know, in a nice way. Um, it gives you quite a lot of um, stuff that you can interact with and um, with the people on the door. Um, and so that's a good one to go to. But again, at that point, you might be really, it might be so clear that they just want you to go. Now, I still would say, maybe try and push it to the next step if you can. If the person's really wanting to go, fine. Just we'll talk about how to end in a moment. 
Um, but always try to push it to the next step. And this, the third one is the big one, the faith question. So facts, friends and family, faith. And the faith question is an easy one. You'll know we're from a local church. Like, do you have a faith yourself? Or have you ever gone to church? Um, have you just avoided them like the plague? Or you might get even further. What do you think about God? And then you might even get to big questions. Now, you wouldn't just trot this one out very quickly, but you might get to big questions like, what do you think happens to you when you die? And people do like to share what they believe, especially if they're expecting you, especially if it's a good time for them. Um, often people do like to share what they believe. They might not want to hear what we believe, but they definitely want to share what they believe. And, and that's the point where if you can then, begin to talk about your own story, how you became a Christian, what you think about Jesus, um, then that's excellent. And, and those are the significant gospel conversations that might change things. But you might not get that far. And if you don't get that far, that's okay. But we will always try to push it that far if we can. And the big thing is you speak with gentleness and you speak with respect. Um, and if it seems appropriate, you can ask bigger questions. Again, our home group last week talked about wobble questions, questions which get people to kind of have to make a decision one way or the other and get into these questions. And um, we can think more about them maybe later on or, or in the year maybe, but, but get into the questions that get people to really think are, are excellent. Now, depending on how you're going at any stage and, and trying to push it to the next step if you can, um, you can finish the conversation really easy by just saying, look, it's been lovely to meet you. Um, if you ever want to come to church, here is a flyer that tells you when our church services meet or we've got this event coming up, we'd love you to come to it. But with some people, um, you might get a chance to say, look, do you want me to pray for you? Because people might share the fact that, you know, they're really struggling, they're suffering. You might get a chance to pray with people on the door. But at any point you're thinking that this really is time to stop, um, then it is just it's really nice to meet you. Thank you so much for talking. Um, and Riverside Church, we're there. And if you need us, please get in contact. Um, and and that that's just an easy end, a nice end. And Whatever else has happened in the conversation, if you end well and end positively, that person has had a good interaction and they have got the chance um, to hear the gospel. Now, even if you have no intention of doing door-to-door, -door, I hope I have stirred you a little bit tonight that you might consider coming along and actually joining in. But even if not, I, I was invited out for cheese and toast. Our family went for cheese and uh, on toast to somebody's house after the network service last night. And there was a guy there who's been coming to the services who's a Sikh. And I just went through facts, friends and faith. Nobody was really talking to him at the time. So I just sat and chatted and we did some facts. We did some friends and family. And then we got stuck into faith and he really wanted to talk. Um, and it was brilliant. And it was just using this little framework in my head thinking, come on, Pete, push it to the next thing if you can. Um, and it was we had a really brilliant conversation. And he said, oh, I'm looking forward to talking to you again next week. Um, after the service, I thought, yes, that's brilliant. And I'm going to pray for this guy um, all week and pray that God gets him ready for that. We're going to finish um, with, I'm going to pray. We've done Welwyn Park Road. We've done Welwyn Park Drive. Um, that's where we ended. So I think it's Welwyn Park Avenue that we're going to try to do as much off on the 17th. But by the time we get to October and November, we'll have done Welwyn Park Avenue as well. And then we'll move a bit further north around it so let me just pray as we finish but i am so grateful for you all coming tonight and your and your helpful input um and so let's just pray now dear father we do want to praise you um because the gospel is glorious you are glorious and you have done so much for us you have stooped down so low and our position in christ is incredible we have life we have you with us now we have the spirit living inside us um, we have a certain future in your presence. As Scott said on Sunday, what's the best thing about being a Christian is knowing you, um, knowing you and, and knowing how good you are. Um, and we just praise your name and we want to share you with the people around us. We would love them to come flocking in our doors. We pray for revival. We pray that your spirit changes this city and our area so that people come flocking in the doors and and they uh, become Christians. And that's, it doesn't seem to be where we're at yet. And Father, in your mercy, you might do that but we can go, we can go out with the gospel. And so please, would you help us to build, to get this ministry going again and to build it up. And Father, I pray that it will become a very important part of Riverside as well, an exciting part that changes us and grows us more like you and, and makes us more prayerful and more dependent upon you. 
But I pray too, Father, that it'll feed well into all the other ministries, that we'll see new people like Marie, like Emily, we'll see people in the years to come um, whom this ministry has been very important for. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the grace you've poured into us in Jesus Christ. And please help us as a church family to keep growing and to keep um, Jesus Christ as our number one priority. We pray these things in your name and for your glory. Amen. 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 Thank you.